and, and approach the world in that way. So those are the, the, the assumptions that I'm going to build from. Um, in, the, in the talk today, what I want to do by the time we're done, I'm hoping that you're going to come away with a sense of why we should care about prejudice and discrimination, um, some of the ways in which our youth may experience prejudice and discrimination, and then have some uh, resources or strategies for how we can help our youth um, overcome the experiences of prejudice and discrimination. Um, prejudice and discrimination, this is going to be the only data I show you, but I think you're going to find it interesting as I talk you through it. Prejudice and discrimination um, usually occurs when members of a group are defined as different, but not just defined as different. That difference is somehow interpreted as being negative, as um, making that group inferior to the status quo or to the mainstream. Um, and, and oftentimes what happens is that people don't have an opportunity to get to know people who are different than them. And so those images stick with them and that's how they end up um, interacting or, or thinking about people who are different than them. Um, the, the group that I want to talk about today, of course, are Arab Americans. Um, and I want to define to you, for you what I mean by an Arab American. An Arab American is someone who I'm defining as, an, uh, who can trace their ancestry back to an Arabic speaking country. Now if you think about that, Arabic speaking country, there are a lot of Arabic speaking countries. 22 to be exact. Which means that Arab Americans are very diverse in terms of national origin. Arab Americans are very diverse in terms of religion. Um, but even with all this diversity, Arab Americans end up being lumped together as being all the same um, by the average American. And although Arab Americans are considered legally white, um, they are politically and socially sorry, that's okay. They are politically and socially marginalized because of US domestic and foreign policy. And what ends up happening then is that Arab, thank you, can you hear me better now? I know I have a softer voice, so this is probably going to help. Um, so Arab Americans are, end up being homogenized, and by that I mean they're looked at as if they're all the same. And one of the ways that we try to understand people's prejudice attitudes is th through thinking about social distance. So what I have up on the screen is called the social distance scale. And it was um, at first initially introduced in the early 20th century, in the 1920s, and it's been administered to college students ever since then. And essentially, it asked college students to um, go through a list of different racial, ethnic, and religious groups and determine the extent to which they would accept members of those groups into their relationships. The closest relationship would be that you would um, accept members of that group into your family through marriage. That's the least amount of social distance. And then it fans out from there. So uh, through marriage, then close friend, neighbor, coworker, speaking acquaintance, visitor to my country, and then the most social distance would be if you said that, that members of this group you'd want to borrow them from your country. Now, what I'm showing up here is uh, data that comes from a survey that was carried out with college students in 2001. And as you can see, circled in red are Arabs, Muslims are not far behind, and many of you, and so they are, they are the group that's identified as the least close in comparison to all these other racial, ethnic, and religious groups. So you may be thinking to yourself, well that was 2001, of course that's going to happen because 9-11 happened. And so therefore, there was a lot of negativity associated around Arabs and Muslims, so that's probably not surprising. However, I actually have my students collect this kind of data every semester when I teach a course on US racial and cultural minorities. The last time I taught this course was in this past fall. And guess what the findings are? Still in 2017, this was in 2017. In 2017, so about 16 years later, I still get the same results that my students collect from students around campus. And when we have a discussion in, with, uh, in the classroom to talk about why this may be the case, the students tell me, well, that's because people don't know Arab Americans. The only thing they know about Arabs and Muslims is what they see in the media. 
Okay, so this again underscores so important for Arab Americans to get out and, and mingle with other cultures, get to know people who are different than them. So the question is, okay, so this is one of the reasons why we should care about prejudice and discrimination. Um, media ends up, be, media stereotypes actually end up being the primary means by which the average American understands what is an Arab or what is a Muslim. And these stereotypes are gendered. For women, there are a couple of very prominent stereotypes. One is um, Arab women are overly sexualized as belly dancers. This is a very common stereotype. Or at the opposite extreme, they're um, considered to be veiled. Both of those representations assume oppression. Arab women are uniformly considered oppressed, and that's it. For Arab men, the stereotypes are terrorists oil chic, camel jockey. Those stereotypes connote backwardness, greed, and um, violence. So we have these stereotypes that exist, and, and I, I'm not naive enough to think that only Arabs are negatively stereotyped. We can think of negative stereotypes for just about any group. The issue here is that these negative stereotypes, which are which are deeply entrenched now in American culture. They're not new. They've existed for decades. Deeply entrenched in American culture. And the issue that I have is not that there's negative stereotypes, but the, but the fact that it's the only image that most Americans see when it comes to Arabs, Arab Americans, or Muslims. It's the only image. We writ Positive images are just about non-existent. Now, there is one complicated example which is directly related to our youth, and that's Disney's Aladdin. How many of you are familiar with Aladdin? Came out in 1990. Um, very popular film, kids loved it. And this film actually has some potential. Why? Because the two protagonists, Aladdin and Jasmine, um, actually are, are, they're tied to Arab culture and they're presented in positive ways. Aladdin's a very clever young man, he's got a good heart. Um, he wants to work really hard and be successful. It's sort of like a rags to riches kind of theme. Um, he's a diamond in the rough. It's a very American idea, right? You just look at the individual. You should look at the individual and not his background. We want to take people as individuals. Jasmine is actually credited as the very first ethnic princess in the Disney line, so that's positive. She also has uh, very good characteristics and that that jive with American culture. She's very strong-willed and she wants to rebel against the kingdom rule that she shouldn't have to get married by the time she's 18. Okay, so these are some positivities, but the reason why I say it's complicated is because the bad guys in Aladdin, and I have two of them up here, that's Jafar, and then the palace guards, um, not only do their features resemble caricatures that have been used for decades to um, make Arab Americans others, or not quite human, or not quite like us. But the bad guys all have accents. And that's dangerous, because what it does is it tells kids that people with accents should be feared. And so kids then grow up thinking, I'm not, I'm not going to say that media tells kids what to think, but it's the only image that you get. So it, 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 they internalize these kinds of things. Um, there's another element to Aladdin, which you all may be aware of. Uh, it was a big to-do uh, with ABC taking the lead, and uh, Dr. Jack Shaheen, who's not with us anymore, may he rest in peace, but he was such an um, advocate for Arab American rights, and he led the um, opposition to Disney because of a lyric in the song. Does anyone remember the lyric in the song? Oh, I come from a land from a faraway place where the camel caravans roam, where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. That was the original lyric from the song. And ADC and Dr. Shaheen advocated that Disney remove that line from the song because it just reinforces the stereotype. It's all anyone ever hears about Arab culture. They were not successful in getting Disney to take it away in the movie theaters, but by the time it came out on video, they replaced it with a more, um, a less controversial line, something about it's really hot there, so that's why it's barbaric, as opposed to being barbaric because they cut off your, 
um, arm, ears if they don't like your face. And it doesn't make reference to camels. So trying to get away from the stereotypes. Okay, so these stereotypes are um, prevalent. They've been around for a really long time. It's what the general public basically knows about Arab, Arabs, Arab culture. And then, of course, Arab is oftentimes equated with being Muslim, even though, as many of you may know, the majority of Arab Americans in the U.S. are actually Christian. But the average American wouldn't think that. Um, so going back to the different contexts that youth um, develop in, I said family is really important, but family, of course, isn't the only place where they have relationships and social interactions. Other contexts for us to think about are the context of friendships, peers. Um, and what may happen for our youth and for our children is they may be called out, uh, called out in terms of being called derogatory names, and some uh, names that children have actually reported as being called terrorists, being called a raghead, being called ISIS. Um, children being reported, uh, reportedly being told that uh, they're accused of care having a bomb and wanting to kill other people. I mean, imagine kids being told that this is who they are, this is what they're afraid of, even if it's in a joking way. That's telling the child that there's something wrong with them and with their culture in the, in the American context. So that's something to be really concerned about. And even when it's not happening directly in terms of um, children being called negative labels or being um, accused of wanting to do hurtful things. Um, another important context in which we have to be aware of is our schools and curriculums. 